Hello, this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is an in-depth build guide for the NZX TH7 Flow RGB 2024. Although this is a little bit different because as you can see, I'm using the Lian Lee Hydra Shift all-in-one cooler and some SL120 V2 fans along with a vertically mounted 3090. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to recreate this PC and the steps for building and crafting in a wonderful, pretty awesome looking gaming PC. I'm quite happy with how this came out. Let me know what you think in the comments maybe some infinity fans might have been a bit nicer depends on your personal preference but i wanted to craft something that was a little bit different from what i did before with the standard nzxt build with a front mounted radiator and nzxt single frame fans which was also pretty awesome and i'm going to compare both these builds in a review which i'll do separately but here i want to show you the step-by-step -step process for building in this pc like this and also I'm going to leave timestamps down below so that you can easily jump to the relevant places if you know what you're doing or if you want to find out more about specific parts of the build. I'll also leave specs of the build down below so you can find out what's included as well as links to the relevant things that I use so you can purchase them or see how much they are in your region if you're curious. But I want to start by deconstructing the case and talking about a few things for the build process. Obviously, this is the 2024 version of the H7 Flow RGB, so it's an updated model, which features some nice highlights, like a slightly repositioned power supply unit, and also a recessed area for your fans. It comes with three fans pre-installed in that single frame design at the front, though for this build, we're abandoning them in favor of the SL120 V2 fans from Lee & Lee, simply for some uniformity throughout the case. Now, as you can see, a lot of the panels will just pull off with relative ease. And then there's a removable hard disk drive cage at the back there, which also take SSDs. This single frame fan is wired into the front, so we will need to remove that. But it is a pretty nice setup to have that fan included as standard. And then you have a number of front panel connectors, including USB-A, USB-C, HD audio, and front panel. And I'm gonna show you where to plug those in later on to make your life a little bit easier. But that's where those are located on the left-hand side, run down some channeling. Now, as you can see, this case is pretty much stripped down. It is set up to take an ATX motherboard as standard, which is worth noting, but it will also work with an EATX if you're curious. The accessories box that you took from the SSD tray has a number of different screws included in it, all of which are clearly labeled. I'm gonna show you this setup and installation process for a lot of different things here, including the power supply unit, the motherboard, the all-in-one cooler and more. But it's worth noting that these bags are clearly marked with what they are. And there is also paperwork included to show you where they go. However, I'm going to obviously demonstrate what's for what as we go through this build process with a step-by-step -step guide that should hopefully help you with your build if you want to do something similar. I've also done detailed guides separately on how to wire your PC, as well as a full PC building playlist with lots of different tips and tricks videos that you might find useful. I'm going to start with the SSDs and hard disk drive mountings. You'll see that the tray that you can remove from the rear is able to hold two hard disk drives or two SSDs or a mixture of the two. So you'll see the screws that you need for this build process are the 632 by 5 millimeter when attaching to this tray. Take care to mount the drive so that the connectors on it face towards the left so that they're easy to plug in in a minute. For SSDs, we're using the M3 by 5 millimeter screws and the same logic applies. You'd face them to the left-hand side for the connectors for the power and the data transfer, and then screw them in from the rear with four screws per SSD or per hard disk drive. They are different screws, obviously, but you also have the option to mount SSDs on this tiny little tray at the bottom of the case, which can take two 2.5-inch SSDs. These are slightly differently mounted with screws going into the side instead of the underside, and you will need to face them so that the connectors are away from the thumb screw on the left hand side so that you can easily plug the cables in. So potentially in this case you can mount four SSDs or two hard disk drives and two SSDs in there and connect up a few different drives for easy access. You can see that this drive needs to be screwed in on both sides and then you end up with a tiny bay that you can nestle away at the bottom of the case and is held in place with that thumb screw. So you have options in where you install them or indeed if you do install them. And then this tray goes back 
where the motherboard would sit. It's worth noting you can easily remove that if and when you need to install the back plate for your all-in-one cooler as it's just held in place with a screw but if you're not planning on using it you could take it out entirely and just mount an SSD tray to the bottom and put your SSDs down there instead. Now for the motherboard setup I'm using an ASRock Live Mixer Z790 along with a Core i9-14900K CPU from Intel. Just gently seat that CPU down into the socket there, taking care to line up the notches at the top and bottom and gently seating it down over the pins before then putting the lever back down to hold it in place. For the RAM, we're using Crucial DDR5 Pro Series RAM and you need to use the second slot and the fourth slot. So that's A2 and B2. Doing this makes sure that you make the most of XMP. Now I often get asked what about using four sticks. For DDR5 it's still pretty unstable to use four so my recommendation is to get two where possible. We're using a PNY Gen 5 NVMe SSD because it's super fast and has its own cooler built in and this thing needs to be wired into a chassis fan header on your motherboard. Now this is a pretty fast drive and this live mixer motherboard does support PCIe Gen 5, but not all motherboards will, so it is worth taking care to purchase the right things when you're buying for your build. You'll see that the top port on this motherboard has a large heat shield on it. Usually I'd recommend using those sorts of heat shields to keep your drive cool, although obviously this one has its own cooling capabilities, so I'll remove that entirely and set it off to the side, then gently slot the drive into the port at the top there and then we need to secure it down with the m2 screw which was included with the motherboard so making sure that's nicely secured and then connect it up to a chassis fan header or system fan header on the motherboard so the little fans on it can spin now it's quite a long cable so i found i actually had to end up running it along the right hand side and then sort of hiding it away a little bit by plugging it into one of the bottom ports instead because otherwise it's going to end up looking a little bit messy and that's not ideal in a nice build we're trying to create. It's worth noting that you will need to adjust the fan speed of this drive though because I did find that if it ramps up to full speed it's very loud so I'd recommend checking that in the BIOS when you get there. Now for installing the motherboard we're gently seating that in place. As I said it's already set up for an ATX motherboard so this will slot down. We need the 632 by 5 millimeter screws to secure it across the various different standoffs. There's three in the bottom, three in the middle and three on the top. So we just screw that into place and make sure it's nicely secured. Then we're going to run those connectors in which I mentioned earlier on. So the USB-C and USB-A front panel connections, which is where you plug in your cables in the top of the case, will connect on the right hand side. You'll notice for the USB-A port, it has a little notch on it. So you need to make sure you plug that in the right way around because you can't plug it in both ways. And the same logic for the USB-C, it's actually a bit fiddly to plug in. You can only plug it in one way around. So make sure when you do that it clicks into place. Clearly I'm showing you this outside the case so it's easy to see. But the front panel connector is for your power button and that plugs in on the right hand side. You should have something marked F panel or something similar on your motherboard. And then the left hand bottom side is the HD audio. Both of those are missing pins you'll notice. So you can only plug them in one way so it's actually fairly straightforward. Next we're looking at the lovely Lee and Lee Edge power supply unit which is actually intriguing for a number of reasons. One you'll notice the connectors are ever so slightly different and also two it has its own built-in USB hub which means that you can plug in multiple different USB devices if you need them and then run a signal cable out from it to the motherboard and I'll show you what I mean in a second. But you'll notice it's quite a bit different from your standard power supply unit. This is a 1000 watt power supply, so more than enough power for this build. Although I would recommend checking out a power supply unit calculator to make sure that you've got enough juice for your machine if you're using slightly different specs to me. You'll see that there are a number of cables included in the box that we're going to need to connect up. And these are very nice as well because they come with their own cable combs and can be tidied up fairly nicely. We're going to start with the motherboard power supply wiring. So the 24 pin power cable, this large chunky one here, which has one large connector on one side and then two split on the other end at the power supply end. You'll notice these are individually sleeved cables 
and cable combs, and it's all held together with Velcro tie to start with, which you'll need to remove. But the idea here is that you slide those cable combs around to tidy things up. We also have two 8-pin CPU power connectors, which are marked PSU on one end and CPU on the other. CPU end obviously plugs into the motherboard, PSU end goes into the power supply. I'm using a Strix motherboard here for demonstration purposes, but what we're going to do is plug the cables in so they're easy for you to see where things connect up so you can get an idea of how to plug them in when you've finished your build. So for the motherboard power supply cables, we're running it from the motherboard here, 18 plus 10 connectors. So the two parts that are split apart on this side here, and you basically need to plug your cable into that and then run it to the 24 pin power connector on the right hand side of the motherboard. You'll notice with all these cables, there is a plastic clip on top, which basically ensures that you're plugging it in the right way and that it is held in place once it's fully installed. Now, take note, I'm obviously showing you this beforehand so you can easily see where things are plugged in and connected up, but actually you'd want to do the motherboard side of this wiring once it's all plugged into your case. Now, for the power supply, you actually have an option because you can see where the ports are, so you could theoretically plug the cables in once it's inside the case, but it is easier to do beforehand, I'll show. Now, the 24-pin power cable plugs in on the right-hand side, and it is a little bit fiddly to connect up. You do need to make sure you push it in all the way until it clicks into place because that little clip will hold it down. But if it is a little bit loose and your power may not come on so your PC might not boot up. What you'll see is that you have these cable combs which obviously you can run and slide along the cables to neaten things up because it is a bit chaotic. But there are several of them throughout that. So when it's in the PC you can actually really tidy these cables up quite nicely and they end up looking really neat when you've finished, which is great for cable management and just for keeping things nice and tidy, which is definitely a benefit of this. And all the cables have the same sort of logic. Now we need the two 8-pin CPU power cables, which plug in on the top left of the motherboard. Again, they're marked CPU on one end and power supply on the other end, so that part plugs in to the motherboard. Notice one of them can actually be split apart. Now, depending on your motherboard, you might have different connectors in the top left you might have two eight pin power connectors you might have one eight pin or you might have one four pin so you can see that you can split one of these cables in part by just sliding them apart and then you basically have one connector that you can easily plug in so i'd recommend connecting these up because they basically allow you to have extra power for your motherboard if you need it for overclocking which some motherboards will have a standard with ai overclocking or the settings in the motherboard and this ensures that your motherboard's getting the power it needs, obviously for the CPU. You can see that they're marked CPU and PCIe ports on the power supply end, so you can plug those into the ports there. And there's a lot of them, because also these ports are used for your graphics card as well, which I'll show you a bit later on. You would plug those in on the one side and then they run the cables through to the top of the case and plug them in the top left of the motherboard. Most motherboards, you'll find them in the same location at the top left. So it might be worth checking your motherboard manual to make sure. And then you just plug these in and push them down. And again, there's a little plastic clip which holds them in place. So you should feel a click when you do seat them there. And then like with the larger cables, you can also run those cable combs throughout. So you'll see the CPU and PCIe power connectors and the ports that you can put them in and how they set up there and then a quick close-up view of plugging in for ease there. Naturally, you'd run these cables through once it's all built in your case, but I wanted to show you so it's really easy to see how you connect the power up for your motherboard before sorting it out. Now, with something like the Lian Lee SL120 V2s, we need SATA power, and there are two types of SATA power cable in the power supply box. You have this one, which has multiple connectors on it, and this connects up to the flat SATA connector that comes out of the fan controller. You'll see that it connects on one end to the SATA and Molex connectors, which are actually at the front edge of the power supply unit. So it runs along that very edge there. And then you have multiple different connectors on here which can plug into the controller. But now there's an L shape to this cable, which means it's difficult to plug in. You can only plug it in one way around, so watch out for that. But as you can see, it's daisy-chained with multiple connections on it, so you can plug in multiple 
cables in there. Some of the Lee and Lee controllers have multiple SATA connections on them, so you could connect that up quite easily. And then you might have a, another controller as well, perhaps. Maybe you're throwing in some different fans into the mix, like some TL fans. And then you have some USB cables that you need to plug in. Now, naturally, you've only got two USB connections on the motherboard, but this power supply unit has the ability to connect four USB connections to it and then a single USB connection that comes out for the motherboard signal. So, for example, we can plug in the SL120 V2 controller to this and the TL controller to this as well and maybe all-in-one cooler if you've got a USB connection from that and other things that have an internal USB connection. And then you have a single cable that runs from the power supply unit to the bottom of your motherboard. This is an alternative to having a powered internal USB hub which will allow you to connect multiple devices and it makes life a lot easier. So it's actually a fantastic addition to a power supply unit because if you have multiple different USB things that you need to plug in that can be a problem. And also with cable management it makes life easier because you're just running one cable from the power supply directly to the motherboard and then all the other USB cables just go to the power supply unit. So it's nice and straightforward and really simple to just sort out and wire at the back. And as I said, you can theoretically plug in four different things to this controller on the power supply end and then just have a single cable running out of it and connecting up. The other sort of SATA power connector is maybe a bit more flexible and has a bit more length between it, which makes it better suited to the hard disk drives and SSDs. It plugs in with the same sort of logic on that front power connector and then it'll run off to the SSDs and hard disk drives you want to install and wire up. You can see that it has some length to it and it may be not enough. So it really depends on the case, but you can see, unfortunately, I couldn't connect in the same place easily, just one to the other. There is a bit of a gap there, a bit strange, but that's going to depend on the case you're building in. So if you're using this elsewhere, it might not be a problem, but here... In this build, it is a little bit of an issue, but you can see we can still connect multiple drives with one cable. Next up, I mentioned the TL series fans require PCIe power. So this is the same connector you'd use for the GPU. So what we're going to do here is plug the power supply unit end, which is clearly marked PSU end, into the power supply. And the same sort of logic as the CPU and power connections we ran earlier on. So that goes in there. And then the other end is a six pin connector which plugs into the TL controller. So this is for the TL LCD fans if you plan on using those. I just wanted to demonstrate. If you're using those fans it needs this sort of power connector which then just plugs in and clicks into place. This is the same for Corsair's IQ Link system, for example. So some of the fan controllers out there do require PCIe power. The good news is there are a lot of these cables included in the box. So you can see we've got four 8-pin PCIe power connectors here. And these can be used for your standard graphics cards from AMD, Intel, and older ones from NVIDIA as well. They are nice individually sleeved cables, again, with the same sort of cable comb logic as well, so they're nice and easy to keep tidy. And they're split into power supply and PCIe adapters, so you can see which end goes where. With obviously the GPU end being the 6 plus 2 power connector, which you need to pinch together before you push it into the graphics card. We plug the power supply unit end into the port smart CPU and PCIe, as we've done already, and then you'd run the other cable to the graphics card. Now, this 3090 requires two of these connectors, but obviously you have more cables if you require them for other GPUs. You might have three or four connectors, for example, that you need to use. You can see that there are some clips on the top of the power port where the plastic clip will sit over the top of it and hold it in place. But be careful to pinch the two parts of this power connector together and ensure that they're held together as you push it in because if the two pin part of it becomes loose that'll mean the GPU is not drawing enough power and that may result in issues with your graphics card just not performing as it should and you might see a FPS drop for example or even display output not working properly entirely but for this GPU that's what the power wiring would look like two cables plugged into the ports obviously when it's fully installed now, it would be ever so slightly different if you have a more recent GPU, like this 4070, for example, which requires an adapter as standard. 
So it comes with this 12 volt high power adapter, which then plugs into four different connectors. You may find your graphics card came with something similar. Basically the logic here is you pinch the cables together as you would as I've just shown you and plug in multiple different connectors there, three or four of these into that single cable which then plugs into the graphics card. Now this is messy and obviously fiddly because you've got to plug a lot of cables in and probably a problem as well if you're also running fans that require these cables for example because you're limited on the number of the cables that you're going to have so it might present an issue in itself but more importantly it just becomes a bit of a faff plugging these all in. The good news is this power supply also has an adapter cable which we can use which is a 12 volt high power cable which replaces these four cables so instead of having to deal with all this cable mess in your case and all the cable combs that you'd need to neaten to tidy things up, we can instead replace them entirely with a single cable, which has a 12 volt high power connector, which is a slightly different pinout on both ends. You can see it's marked 600 watt and it has these blue pins on it instead. It plugs into the GPU on one end and the power supply on the other end and it replaces this adapter so you no longer need to use it. Much, much easier, much neater, and much cleaner for your build as well. So just get rid of the standard power cables, and instead you can see there's a 12 volt high power connection port on the far right hand side of the power supply. You just slot your cable into that, and then the other end goes into your graphics card. So make sure it is pushed all the way in though, and fully seated. I did find that was a little bit fiddly, and it is fiddly on both ends, so it just requires pushing in and making sure it's pushed in nicely and that there's no unnecessary pressure from any of the angles. Now, I would suggest most of the time making sure your power supply is wired before you put it into the case, but the difference with this one is, in theory, you can just put it into the case and then plug the cables into it because, as you can see, you can still clearly see the ports However, I did find it a little bit fiddly to do this, especially once you start plugging in a lot of cables, it becomes a little bit messy. So it still might be easier to work out what cables you want to use beforehand and then plug them all into the power supply unit before you put it in. But as you can see, we're seating it so the fan faces the outside of the case because that will then easily pull air through from the rear of the case and cool the power supply unit. And then you secure it with the four hexagon top screws that come with a PSU or with your case. You should have two lots of screws here. And they go into the four corners of the power supply, screwing it into the case and securing it down. And then if you haven't plugged them in already, you plug those cables in as I showed you. So we'll start with the 24 pin power cable for the motherboard, plug that in on the right hand side at the bottom and then run the cable through. You can see I'm adjusting the cable combs as I go with this so it's neatened up throughout. Obviously the front is where you want the most neat bits to be because that's going to be the most visible. But the nice thing about this is you can tidy it up quite nicely. There's a good bit of channeling through the middle of this case with a number of the Velcro ties that you can run the cables through. So we can neaten things up quite nicely here. You can pull them all the way out and run the cables underneath that to fully secure them. Or you can just unloop them slightly and put them on the top part of it, but you have the option. But these cables are quite flat. They're not the usual really thick, chunky cables that you get with a lot of power supply, even for the 24 pin. So it's quite easy to secure these down and to neaten and tidy them up as well. Once they're secured and tidy, you just need to then run it through to the front by passing it through that gap with the cable hiding tray there, and then flip the case over and plug it in on the right hand side, making sure, as I said, to push it all the way down until you feel it click into place. This can be a little bit tough to do and a little bit fiddly depending on your motherboard, but you should feel a click and then obviously you want to mess around with the cable combs a little bit to tidy the cables up. But because of this cable tray, it's actually mostly hidden away anyway. So it's pretty neat with this installation, quite easy to do. Now for the two 8-pin CPU power connectors, we're going to run them across the right hand side. One of the things that I'll show you here is I found these are actually a little bit tight on this power supply unit. So I would recommend using the top ports as far as you can to the top of the power supply because as you can see once we've run it through over to the wards the top where we'll be plugging them in the actual length of the cable interferes ever so slightly 
with the hard disk drive and where that's mounted. So these maybe are a little bit short in this case. And so securing them with cable ties, for example, at this stage might not be beneficial or it may prove a little bit tricky. Usually I try and neaten these cables up. You might want to do it at some point, but I'd recommend trying to plug them into your motherboard first before you do so that you can make sure that you've got enough slack to do so. Otherwise it might prove to be a bit of a struggle to plug these in now. Now I would recommend doing this before you install anything else, for example, the all-in-one cooler. If you try and put your all-in-one cooler on now, you might find that then trying to reach behind that to plug these cables in could be difficult. So it's easy to get these cables for the motherboard sorted out beforehand. Now with those secured, I'm obviously trying to neaten things up a little bit by using those cable combs so that are nice and tidy and then making use of the Velcro ties at the top as well. What you'll see though, as I said, is that the cabling proves a little bit difficult to negotiate through and to make sure that there's enough length in it so it's not presenting a problem around the hard disk drive area. What I did instead was to actually use cable ties to just tie the cables together rather than securing them to the case. This just then neatens things up so at least they're not in the way of other things and just keeps that nice and tidy for the rest of the build. And these are quite long cable ties though that are included so we're just going to snip them off to make sure they're a little bit shorter and not going to interfere with anything. And then don't forget we need SATA power for the drives. So as you can see I've run the data cables from the drives through to the motherboard already for connecting that up and then they connect up on the right hand side by the 24 pin power cable a bit lower down and then the SATA power the cable from this is that one with multiple connections on it so you can see that we can run one part of this up to those two drives and the other part can go to the ones at the bottom but again, you can just run these through those cable channels, so Velcro ties and neaten things up there. And don't forget that they will only plug in one way around, so don't try and force them in. And then we're going to basically make sure that all the drives are connected so they've got the power. And it's worth doing these things step by step, rather than trying to work out what needs powering at the end, because you will end up with a mess of cables to deal with and maybe not quite sure what's plugging in where or what you've forgotten to plug in. So I'd recommend doing it one bit at a time. Makes life a little bit easier. If you're following these steps, you can make sure that all your drives are powered, for example. Don't forget the ones at the bottom. And then just neaten these cables up as much as you can using those Velcro ties to sort things out so there's plenty of room for the rest of the cables we're going to be using. Now for this build, I'm using SL120 V2 fans, but I wanted to demonstrate with some other fans as well. So this is the Infinity fans, which I actually prefer looks wise, but it's worth bearing in mind that the recess at the bottom of the case can be a bit problematic if you've got larger fans. So you can see here, the connector cable, for example, at the end, presents a little bit of a problem when putting the infinity fans in the bottom because it just sticks out a little bit so it's actually quite difficult to get in there but you can get 320 millimeter fans at the bottom here quite easily these are the standard blade fans obviously i'm putting them face down in the actual build i'm going to be using reverse blade fans because it looks a bit nice you don't have to see the backs of the fans so these are the reverse blade model of the sl120 v2s these are actually a little bit easier to install because they don't have that large connector on the end. They have this flat cable instead which pushes in. So you just need to slot them in there running that cable towards the back. The thing here as well to watch out for with these fans is these connectors on the end that clip the fans together. You can actually twist, turn those and take them off. And I would recommend doing that for this because they actually get in the way where the fan recess is down here. So run the cable through to the back and then you can slot these fans in and they go in more comfortably as long as you've taken those off. So I'll just show you that from a different angle, obviously pushing the cable in first and then slotting them down into place. So it is possible to use fans other than NZXT's fans in here fairly easily and these uni fans will fit in quite nicely. And then they just screw in from below with the various different screw holes that are in here. I did find that I did have to negotiate them in a little bit though. I had to push them around in order to line them up with the holes just because of the way things jut out of the sides. So they're not as easy to install as NZXT fans are. Now I'm gonna pull the front of the case off 
and remove that single frame fan that's pre-installed on there and just take that out for this build. This is a nice setup with this fan. I have done a separate guide on these fans and I talked about the logic of them. They are easy to wire in, but because I want to make uniformity throughout the case and using the same fans are going to remove them. You could alternatively leave that in. They are obviously behind a fan tray, so you don't see them for the most part. But I just wanted to make sure everything was the same across the build. But if you wanted to save money, you could keep this tray in and then just connect them up directly to the motherboard instead. So with these SL120 V2 fans, I'm putting them so you can see the back inside the case. The front of the fans will face outwards. These are standard blade fans, so they're set to intake this way. So they'll be pulling cold air in from the front, obviously securing them by screwing them into the back of the fan tray, and then running that cable through the hole on the side there and slotting the fan tray back in. It's then held in place with two thumb screws at the top You'll notice there are some clips at the bottom of the tray which sit into holes on the case itself and then that's secured there and obviously the cabling is running to the back. Then I have a single SL120 V2 fan which I'm putting on the rear as exhaust and this is a standard blade fan again. So we put that at the back and then secure that on the left hand side of the case with four screws in each corner. So the advantage of these fans is obviously the interlocking design of them, but also the single connector, which comes with a triple pack of fans. I've got a full wiring guide on Lee and Lee fans, whichever ones you're using, you'll find on my channel where I go into depth on how to set these up, but I am going to show you the process for it. If you've got a triple pack, you can use these flat connectors, which is, has one connector on the cable and then that plugs into the fan controller which comes with a triple pack the other advantage of these fans is they have flat cables which can easily be run under the velcro ties and neatened throughout the case in the various different points i'll get to the wiring of these fans in a second to make this easy for you but first of all we're going to start with the hydro shift lcd now i'm doing something a little bit of logic here and i'm swapping out the fans but I want to show you the standard setup for this LGA socket motherboard with the LGA 1700 logic and also some of the interesting highlights of this all-in-one cooler which as you can see the tubes are mostly hidden from. This is actually pretty flexible in that it can be side or top mounted although the recommendation is to top mount it and you can adjust where the tubing sits. You can take this plastic housing off the top and you'll see the tubing runs through here along with the wiring for the fans. So the standard fans that come pre-installed with it are actually wired in, and then the connectors for those fans actually run through the tubing and then come out here and can be connected up at the pump end to the motherboard. So you see it's got a USB connection, SATA power connection, and a CPU fan header connection. So you've got a lot of different cables there, but fairly easy to plug in and easy to keep really neat. For the preparation for the installation with an LGA 1700 socket motherboard and a Z790, which you can see I'm using the Z690 formula motherboard here, but same sort of logic. You peel off the little protective stickers here for the back plate, and this is going to push through to the other side. I'm going to do a full in-depth guide for this cooler, which also shows AMD setup if you prefer to use AMD a little later on. But you basically put that through so the standoffs are on the other side. And then you can see that we have these washers that sit down over the top of those and grip onto them. So it's held on nicely on the back and then secured on. This is a really easy to install in one cooler. It's actually one of the easiest I've seen. The idea with this is that the tubes are hidden away. Before you install it, you'd need to peel off that plastic sticker and put some thermal paste on, which I'll show you in a second. And then essentially the cooler just sits down over the top of those standoffs. Note the pump tubes are coming out of the top here and we need to make sure that they're lined up and neatened up nicely. And then everything's screwed in. So you'd screw in these four screws into those standoffs and plug the cable that comes out of the pump into the CPU fan header on the motherboard and then USB connection would run to the bottom and plug in to the USB connection down there or to the USB connector on the edge power supply. So for this build process as I said I'm going to swap out the fans on this for the SL120 V2s. Again you don't have to do this 
I'm doing it purely because I want to make sure all the fans in the case match up. Also, Lian Lee sent me a black cooler and I'm using it in a white case with white fans. So unfortunately, it's a bit of a mishmash and that's why, obviously, preferably you'd probably want a white cooler, but I'm using what I've got here. So you can unscrew the fans from the radiator and replace them. You need to take that cable hiding tray off the top of the radiator and unplug the fan cables. So obviously here as standard, the fan cables run from the fans through that system and then out, out of the pump. But in order to remove them, I need to actually take the adapters on here. So there's some little brackets that are sat over this for the tubes. Now you can actually remove these and flip them over and put them on the other side. You can maneuver them around into different positions and there's an extra one so you can really tidy these cables up. But for me, what I want to do is just remove them so that I can move the tubes out of the way and then I can pull the fan cabling out because as you can see, it runs into that recess. So obviously we're abandoning the standard cabling here because I'm going to need to use the SL120 V2s and plug them into the controller. But these are actually pretty cool fans, interlocking Unifan style, same sort of logic as other Lee and Lee fans. You can see they've got contacts between them, they clip together, they plug into the radiator and then they're powered by the whole system. So the Hydra Shift setup is actually really nice and very straightforward and I'm making it more complicated which is an important part to note. It's actually very easy and I'm overcomplicating it by changing the fans. But I think this is important because it shows you how to do it if you want to do it and if you want to have the same fans throughout your build. So you can just seat your standard fans over the top. You'll notice that I've got the cable on the right hand side and I've also set the fans facing towards us in the same way they were on the radiator. The logic being that they're going to sit at the top of the case and exhaust air through the rad and out of the top of the case. So we're going to have six intake fans and then four exhausts, these three and then one rear fan. So the cabling for this was a little bit fiddly because obviously it's a little bit different from the standard ones that's including with the fans. We can't just plug them in to the same connector. Got to try and work out a way to run it so that it can be run towards the back of the radiator and then run towards the back of the case and plugged into the controller. And so it's a little bit more difficult to negotiate, but you can reuse the radiator screws that came off the standard fans, plug them through the holes on the fans and then screw them into the radiator and secure the fans down. This was a little bit fiddly to do initially, but then it does secure it in quite nicely. And then we need to make sure we put those brackets back in place for the pump tubes. Now there's two installed as standard, but you can actually install a third one. And one of the things that you will notice when I do this is I end up with the tubes on my pump sort of being a little bit not perfectly aligned. They angle off a little bit to the side. So I would take care and work out how you're going to install them so it doesn't cause that problem. You'll see what I mean with the finished build at the end. But when you're going about this installation, try and work out how it's going to fit into the case, how it's going to fit onto the build, and how it will look with those tubes at the end. So you can leave it as it is with this, or you can put the additional bracket on. I think putting this additional bracket on here Skewing the tubes is actually what caused the problem for me, where the tubes aren't perfectly aligned. They look a little bit wonky, basically. So you might not want to do what I've just done. It's going to depend on your setup and how you do it and how you negotiate it into the build. But you can see ever so slightly wonky. And it's more of a problem because of just how tight it is once it's installed. So I'd recommend trying to work it out beforehand, before you install the radiator and the pump head, because it becomes a little bit fiddly after that. Then with that cabling from the end of the fans, also trying to work out how it's going to run underneath this tray that hides away the pump tubes. And I did find that it is actually possible to run that cable because it's flat through in the same sort of logical way, hiding it away through this area, the recessed area, so that it can still be quite neat. So you can do that and then push it off. And I'm pushing it off in the direction where it will basically be coming out and running towards the back of the case so we can hide it out of view because that's obviously the whole point in this plastic housing that sits over the top of the tubes is to hide everything away. The design for this Hydra Shift all-in-one cooler is designed to make basically a lot of the stuff invisible so it's not easy to see. 
Now, because I'd already installed the motherboard earlier on, I need to remove the hard disk drive tray, which I installed, and that will give me access to be able to install the back plate on the back of the motherboard. So I wanted to show that you could do this, and this is how you do it. So you can take that off as long as you can access the back. You can then slide that through and push it into the front and making sure those stickers hold the back plate in place. I usually prefer doing this before I install the motherboard and that's because exactly this reason it's easier to access the back when the motherboard's not in the case and also just to make sure that that back plate's on and also that the standoffs can easily be secured to it but just demonstrate you can do it if you've already installed the motherboard. Put the standoffs through, put the washers down over the top of it and ready this for the installation of the all-in-one cooler. With the installation here, don't forget that we need to make sure we can run the cables for the fans to the rear, because obviously that's going to be a bit fiddly if you put the radiator in first, so just try and negotiate that through the holes at the back there, and then securing it to the top of the case with these small screws that are included with the all-in-one cooler itself. There are a lot of these screws that need to be screwed in at the top here. You'll see there are various different points here, but you will notice there is some wiggle room, so you can move the radiator slightly to the right or to the left. So if you find that the pump tubes are a little bit squiffy, you could perhaps move it that way. Now this cooler doesn't come with pre-applied thermal paste, but it does come with a tube of thermal paste that you need to apply to the CPU. So put a blob down in the middle and then I'd recommend using a spatula to then make sure you've got a good coverage across the CPU. Don't forget to remove that sticker that's on the pump block before installing it, otherwise you won't get good cooling. And then carefully seat that down over the standoffs we put in place earlier on. Take care to seat this down really carefully so that you don't damage the thermal paste while doing so. And then we're going to secure this with the four screws in each corner use a screwdriver and keep screwing until it won't screw in anymore take the care to do it alternate corners so you have equal pressure throughout the whole thing don't force it but just make sure you screw until they won't go any further and so it's tight enough that will give you good cooling we then have these cables that we have to sort out one of which runs to the cpu fan header on the motherboard that ensures that the motherboard can see the pump speed and can control it. We then run the SATA power connector and the USB cable through to the rear where we're going to sort those out. Those are very important connections so we make sure you connect those up properly. The SATA power obviously needs to go to the power supply unit, USB connection to the motherboard otherwise the display won't work properly. There's then a bracket included with the cooler which you can sit down over the top of those screws so they're not visible which is a nice touch and then these cables at the rear so the SATA power connector is the same that you'd use for the hard disk drives and SSDs and you want to make sure you secure those cables so they're neatly out of the way and then plug that power cable in it is important because otherwise the pump won't be getting the power that it needs and so the display might not work but also it might not cool properly so you want to make sure that's plugged in and then the USB connection is equally important because that allow you to control the display with L Connect. Either plug that directly into the motherboard or into the USB connection on the power supply unit. Now in terms of the fan wiring, the fans from the radiator, I'm plugging them into port 1 on the controller here. Make note of that because we're going to adjust the settings in L Connect software to make sure the fan speed is adjusted according to CPU temperature. Then you plug in the other cables from the other fans we connected up earlier, the bottom, the front and the rear one, to the controller. The USB connection from the controller plugs into the power supply unit with the signal from that coming out of the power supply unit and going into the motherboard to make sure that you've got control over those fans nice and easily. And don't forget that this also requires SATA power. You may need two cables for this for the SATA power connections on that and then secure all the cables and neaten things up as much as possible and don't forget to run the USB cable from the power supply unit to the motherboard as well so that you've got the connectors from that running in and everything's connected up and your motherboard can see it and you'll be able to control the fan speed the RGB lighting and the display doing a test boot now before installing the graphics card and you can see we've got RGB from everything if we wait a second, you should see a flicker as the display comes on. Notice there's also some backlighting on the motherboard with some RGB lighting on it as well. 
So a lot of nice bits going on here. We can then remove the protective film over the top of the cooler and get about building the rest of the machine. Now you have some options in how you're going to install your graphics card. I'm going to start by showing you how to standard install it in a horizontal position. As shown earlier on, we need two power supply cables for this because I'm using the 3090. So two of the eight pin PCIe power cables plugged into the PSU ports. You'll now see what I was saying about it being a little bit more fiddly once loads of cables are plugged in. It's uh, harder to negotiate these cables in here, although you still can see on the edge power supply where the cables would go. With a more traditional power supply unit, it would be definitely difficult at this stage to work out where you plug in your cables in, especially at this angle and with this amount of cables in there, it becomes awkward. We can put the door back on now as well because it's mostly finished with the rear of the build so we can close that up nice and easily. Plenty of space there thanks to some good cable management. Uh, you notice that I've removed the two brackets at the back here for the PCIe brackets and then you can just slot your GPU into place. Notice that I've got a nice bit of a purple accent on the side of this Gigabyte GPU. I uh, <laughs> accidentally goes nicely with the purple motherboard and NZXT's purple colors as well. Make sure you secure your GPU by putting the screws in on the left hand side and then plug in your two 8-pin PCIe power cables, making sure to push them together so they're clipped together nicely and pushed all the way in so they're fully seated into the GPU, otherwise it might be a problem. And then you can adjust the cable combs you can see me doing to try and neaten things up. I actually ended up running a little bit of Velcro tie down the bottom as well. You could maybe use some plastic cable ties to tidy them together because you can see there's a little bit of a gap between these two cables, but I thought they looked okay like this. And in the end, I'm going to end up with a vertical GPU mount anyway. But I wanted to show you how you could set it up as standard. And this is what the standard finished product would look like if you're not going to use a GPU mount. To vertically mount it which is a separate purchase not included with the case but as you can see it looks pretty clean in this build i think i've come out quite nicely with a finished product that looks quite nice and neat the cooler is definitely nice and tidy although again it probably would look nicer with a white one but i have got a blackish motherboard as well so maybe the contrast between black and white is quite nice let me know what you think in the comments if I've made a mistake and maybe I should have had a white one in there. But the end product looks pretty good in this build, I think. However, to make it look even better, we can use a vertical GPU mount. So this is NZXT's vertical graphics card mount. It will work in this case quite easily and fits in a number of other NZXT cases really simply as well. You need to remove all of the PCIe brackets from the rear of the case instead of just those two that I removed earlier. And you'll notice here that I actually missed one, so pay attention to that because you do need to remove them all. The GPU now slots in to this vertical mount instead. It has the same sort of logic, the same PCIe bracket that it would secure into, and it equally needs to be secured into that with two screws that will screw in on the left-hand side to make sure the graphics card is secured nicely there. So you quickly do that. And the way this works is then that cable from the back plugs into the top port on a new motherboard and then this bracket slots in to the holes that we've opened up at the rear and then you can see obviously you've got access to the display port and HDMI connections at the back quite easily. So you just plug this cable into the top PCIe X16 slot. Make sure you use the top one whether you're mounting vertically or in the standard position because it will make sure you've got the most amount of speed and then you need to slot the vertical bracket in you'll see that you need to make enough space for it so you do need to remove all the PCIe brackets from the rear here and then slot it down into that back port one thing of note is I left the foot on the bottom of the vertical GPU bracket sticking out a bit too far so it was interfering with the shelf which is why I couldn't quite get it into place very easily so if you just roll that up a bit you'll find that it sits a little bit onto the shelf and it's a bit better seated there and then you can secure it with two screws at the rear into the bracket there and that will then ensure that it doesn't sag and cause any issues. Then the power cables need to rerun to the back of it. This is a little bit more fiddly because it's not as easy to see 
but you need to basically push them into the same place, same sort of logic. But you can neaten the cables up even more there because we can hide most of them away from the rear. And then you end up with a nicer looking build. There's plenty of space there, as you can see, all around the GPU. You can also select through various different displays on the all-in-one cooler pump head once you've gone through the Windows installation and you've downloaded L Connect, which I'll show you in a minute. So you can set that up so you can see various different things, including the time, GPU and CPU temperatures and loads and other things. And it's got some really nice effects on it. As I said, though, you might notice the tubes are just slightly tilted off to the left. So I'd recommend adjusting the tubing, as I said before, you install the radiator. Otherwise, you might have the same problem as me. But you do have a very nice display here, and I'm pretty happy with how this build has come out. So now we're going to pop on all the panels back in place, and then we're going to go and set up a BIOS update, Windows install, and downloading and setting up L Connect so you can see how to do that, because you won't have the same view that I've got here unless you do that first. Hopefully you found this useful so far. Subscribe if you haven't already. And let me know in the comments what you found the most useful. Thanks for watching all this way. I realize it's a long video, but hopefully the detail and depth of it has been useful to you. And so we just pop in the panels back on into the various different positions. I've already peeled the plastic off in a, in a previous video, so unfortunately I can't do it now. But as you can see, we've got a very nice looking case here. And what you should find, or at least what I did anyway, is that it runs nice and quietly as standard. So if you've done everything correctly and followed along, as I've done, you should find that you've got a nice quiet system at idle like this. And then we can go about setting up the rest of the things. Next up, I'd recommend downloading the latest BIOS for your motherboard. So in this case, the Z790 Live Mixer, head over to the website and find the latest BIOS to download and install. This is worth doing, especially if you're using a high-end CPU like I am, because the 13th and 14th gen CPUs need a BIOS update to optimize the settings so that they run well. And I've done a video separately on this, but what we need to do is download the BIOS and then extract it and put it on a USB drive. So you'll need a separate PC for this naturally. Run the download, extract it to a USB stick, and install it on there. And then we're gonna stick that USB stick into the new PC, plug that in and then turn it on and mash the delete key to get into the BIOS. I'd recommend doing this. It will just make sure everything's more stable and runs nicely on your system. So mash that delete key. And then on this motherboard, we're looking for the instant flash tool in the bottom right here. And this allows you to then run the BIOS updates. Now BIOS updates can be risky. You need to have real patience when doing it. Take your time, don't turn your PC off, let it go, do its thing. It might reboot a few times during the process. You can brick the system if you're not careful, if you turn it off or panic at any point. So you really need to take care with it. But it is worth doing with the high-end CPUs to make sure your system is more stable and runs nicely as expected. And it can also help with things like your RAM as well. So if you find your XMP isn't working properly or your system won't boot with XMP on, updating your BIOS might fix this. And I'm doing this early on now before even installing Windows just to show you the setup for that. And talking of Windows installations, here's how to do that. So on the other PC, you want to search for Windows Media Creation Tool and click on this link to create installation media for Windows and then click for Windows 11, create Windows 11 installation media. Click to download that and then you'll have a tool to run and you need to run this tool and tell it the USB stick that you want to put it on. So follow the instructions for that. And this will take some time. Now, obviously you need a separate PC for this, but I've actually shown it is possible to do this on your phone so you can create an installation media on your phone. I've got a separate guide for doing that if you don't have a spare PC. But what we're looking to do here is to run this program and to create the tool that you can then have on your USB drive, plug that into the motherboard on your new PC and then run it from there. So you can then go about installing Windows. And this actually is a fairly straightforward process, but it does obviously require a little bit of work because you'll need to be able to run this separately and to put it on the drive itself. So once that's finished, 
what you then want to do is pop it into the motherboard and turn your PC on again. And then you should find that eventually it will boot into the tool for installing Windows. Now, if you have a single drive on there, the installation for it is really straightforward. You click to select the right language and your format. So in this case, United Kingdom and then click to install. And then we're gonna follow the on-screen instructions and go through this process. I haven't got the key to hand just yet, but we're gonna install Windows 11 Home, the variation of that, and then click through onto the next page, accepting all the various different terms. We want custom, install Windows only, and you'll notice those brackets advanced. And then we want to create a new part on the drive that's been recognized so you can see We've got this one terabyte drive here. We click for a new format of that, click apply, and then that will go through and install partitions on the drive for Windows. And then we just click next, and then it will go through copying and installing the files. And you'll see it will take some time. So you have to be, be a little bit patient and wait for this to go through this process. And it will keep going and going and going. But what I want to do is to try and reboot at some point. So you'll see that it will give you a warning that it's going to reboot. So I'd actually recommend hanging around nearby during this process because what you want to do then when it's about to restart, so when you can see this, take your thumb driver out because otherwise it will try and reboot from that and it can cause problems. Take that out and then it should start to boot into the Windows and finish off the installation. And eventually you should just get into Windows and you should be good to go. Next up, we need to obviously download the relevant things that we're going to be using. The most important, which is Alconnect 3, if you've set it up as I have. So head over to Google and search for Alconnect 3 and make sure you get it from Lee and Lee directly, not from this dodgy advert at the top. Head over to there and then look for the Microsoft redistributed packages for Visual C++. Download those and the Alconnect 3 software and then download and install it. Once installed, you should hopefully see a screen that looks something like this. You'll notice Hydra Shift LCD on the left-hand side and the SLV2 Infinity fans as well. So hopefully you've seen both in here if you've connected up everything properly. The first thing to note is the fan pump profile. You want to head over there and have a look for port one, which is where we put the fans that we put on the radiator. If you click on that, you can adjust the fan profile and make sure you set it to respond to the CPU temperature. That way these fans on the radiator will adjust according to the CPU temperature. When it raises, they will spin faster, therefore putting more cold air through the radiator. Now with the other ports, you can obviously choose to select the GPU instead. So you might choose the fans on the bottom of the case, for example, or on the front to respond to the graphics card temperature. You can do this from the drop down at the bottom here and adjust accordingly. And then you can change the fan profile or the fan curve either manually or from the selector on the left hand side. You might set two lots of fans to the CPU and two lots to the GPU. But the important point is making sure the fans on the rad are responding to the CPU temperature so they are spinning up properly. You can also choose motherboard RPM sync at the top left, assuming you connected the controller to your motherboard with the 5 volt RGB header and the system fan header up there but generally I prefer using Alconnect because it's easy to control everything from here. In the SL V2 fan utility you can select from the various different RGB lighting profiles on there and you can choose to apply the fan profile to all of them as well as the lighting effects so there's lots of different ones to choose from there and you can apply it to the entire case at once. And under the Hydra Shift LCD display options, you can obviously choose from the various different screen options, some of which I've shown. I'll go into more depth on this in the full review and setup guide on this cooler, but you should find, hopefully you see all these screens and you can go through and choose your own options in here and set what you want to, as well as the fan speed for the fans if you're leaving the standard ones on and setting it up so that you can see various different displays for CPU temp, GPU load and other things like that. And I would recommend keeping an eye on the settings and update and then making sure you've got the latest firmware in here as well. So that's worth checking when you first install the system and making sure that the things inside are fully installed. Then you can go about downloading and installing Steam and graphics drivers and everything else and enjoying your system. Hopefully you found this video useful 
If you did, subscribe and come back for more. Let me know in the comments down below. And thanks very much for watching. I appreciate you. You've made it right to the end of the video, you brilliant legend you. If you've enjoyed it, click that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up, and drop me a comment down below if you've got any questions. If you really enjoyed it, consider joining the channel and see the benefits of doing so. Check out these other videos. You might well find them interesting or useful. And most importantly, have a great life.